When you first became a Christian, you told everybody, didn't you? Do you remember? I mean, I can remember. It was a long time ago. I became a Christian 40 years ago, and I can still remember telling everyone else in my, my class at, at, uh, at school, teachers, my parents, they were a bit bewildered. I think they thought I'd gone even stranger than I was already. Everywhere, telling people about Jesus. But as we've been Christians longer, we can lose that passion, can't we? This is GBC Web TV, on the internet at gbcweb.tv. Welcome to Greenford Baptist Church in West London. Here you can watch inspired biblical teaching and find out how to apply God's Word to your everyday lives. Father God, thank you for your presence with us this morning. Thank you that you've been with us as we've worshipped, as we've prayed. Thank you for the testimonies we've had this morning of, of the way that you've worked in people's lives, not just over a minute or five minutes or uh, a year, but over an entire working life, the way that you have been there and been in every situation and, and others that you've been with them in ups and downs of life. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you work on a long time scale. Thank you, you're not a God just of the instant, but you're a God of the marathon. Father, as we come to look at your word this morning, I ask that you will speak to us again. Open our eyes to see. And Father, may we be those people who have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church as we listen together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a, we are continuing, if you're here for the first time, uh, welcome to you. We are uh, in the early parts of a series that we're doing, looking at the whole of the book of Revelation. And uh, as you would have seen from the screen, we're beginning at chapter 2 today, looking at the first uh, 17 verses. Very first week I did a, a long and detailed introduction to the book of Revelation. The, it's on the website so I'm not going to rehash that, you can look at it. If you've not listened to that, you really need to do so. I mean, not before you listen to me today, but it is important that you listen to that, that help, help you understand the book as we go through and the nature of the book. So if you've not listened to it, it's on the website in high definition, really good quality, so you can watch it and, uh, and listen. Uh, but just to recap, uh, a, just a very few points. The context that this letter was written to, and, and the whole of the book of Revelation is, is a letter that's sent to uh, churches in the area that was known at that time as Asia. And it's a place where Christians were subject to discrimination and to harassment. Uh, if they found themselves being taken to court, uh, whilst being a Christian itself was not illegal, they could be required to go to court, and in that uh, situation they would have to recognise Caesar as Lord, they'd have to worship him, curse Christ, and if they refused to do that, it would lead to torture and would lead to death. And we saw that the core theme of the, the book of Revelation is that whatever the appearance may be, God is in control, now and forever. Not just in control of what happens to us today and tomorrow, not just this week, this month, this year, but for eternity. And we need to, as we read the book of Revelation, we need to be thinking in those big terms. This is a big brushstroke book. So this isn't about what you're doing this afternoon, this is about what you're doing for the rest of eternity. That's the context that we need to be listening to the book. Last time, we looked at uh, chapter 1, verses 9 down to verse 20. And uh, it's a very important, in uh, fact, it's an integral part of the passage that we're going to look at today, uh, this time in chapter 2, 
and next time when we finish chapter 2 and look at the whole of chapter 3, all the time we'll be going back into chapter 1 because it links back and also as we will see it links forward as well to the end of the book. Uh, so these letters are integral as we'll see in a moment. So, two weeks ago if you were here or if you've uh, looked at it on the website, what were the key things that we learnt from that chapter 1 verse 9 down to verse 20 when we had that a description of an image of Jesus and uh, how he was uh, dressed and how he looked and we saw that each of those pieces of description were symbolic, they stood for things. What were the key things that we learnt last time? That is the Alpha and the Omega and everything else in between. Which means? Both beginning beginning and, and end. And everything. All of history, between. thank yeah. you. Some may know what Alpha and Omega oh, was, so that's you were right, I was just trying to draw a bit more out. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, the key thing maybe uh, God was in control and he, he is there to see it up to the end. Mm -hmm. He's in control. There to see to the end. I saw some hands over here. That he's um, a big, awesome, scary God. Mm. Powerful. Yeah. Uh, the, the description is a sign. Like you said, the fire exit sign is a sign. But the fire exit is the fire exit, so it's not it doesn't literally look like this. It's a sign of his power. Yep. And Very good. Authority by the the sash of authority that he wears mm. in the picture. Mm. There is this this sense, isn't there? Of um, I, I can't remember if I said last time, but but in uh, in John's gospel we have um, uh, John laying with his head on Jesus's chest, almost cuddling up to Jesus. But this is not the sort of Jesus you cuddle up to. And we talked last time, I'm sure, about the, 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 the two sides. There is God's, uh, Jesus' transcendence, his power, his awesomeness. At the same time, there is his proximity and his closeness. The other th one of the other themes that we brought out last time that will come up time and time again today is about our need in the context that Jesus is Lord of all, that Jesus conquered death, that Jesus holds the keys, that in the context of all of this, we need to patiently endure. There was that theme last time, do you remember, about patiently enduring. And we're going to come back to that several times today. Now, chapter 2 and chapter 3 of uh, Revelation uh, consist of... Um, what look like seven letters to seven churches in different towns, all in the a area known as Asia, which is uh, now part of uh, the coastal area uh, of Turkey. It is really important that we understand right at the beginning that these are not seven separate letters to seven different churches. Like we have, you know, in the New Testament, we've got the letter to the church in Ephesus, two letters to the church in Corinth. Uh, they are very specific letters to specific churches. These seven letters are not that. In fact, they all were for all. So all of these letters were read to all of these churches. But they're not just all of them for all just then. They're all for all now. This is part of God's word to the church, hence the title this morning, God's word to the church. They're not really proper letters. They are prophetic messages that bring God's word to his people, both then and now. And uh, you'll notice as we go through today that each of the seven letters follows a standard pattern. They're not identical, but there is a standard pattern that is repeated in each of the letters. And uh, there are, people divide it up in different ways. I've divided it up into, into six. Some make it seven, some make it four, just depending on how they lump things together. But uh, I've uh, put it into, into six sections. The first section of each letter is you, you have the, the name of the church addressed. We're looking at three today, Ephesus, uh, Smyrna, and Pergamum. And all of these were in main cities in the area. Now we know that there were more than seven churches. We, we know the names of other churches in that area. But the number seven, of course, is symbolic. And seven is symbolic of 
completeness. So that's why there are these seven. This is uh, the complete message to the church, then and now. So the name of the church addressed, first of all, we looked last time, it's actually addressed to the angel of the church. Last time we looked at what that meant, so uh, you can go back to that and have another listen if you've uh, forgotten that. Second thing in each letter is a description of Christ. And they link straight back into chapter 1. Every one of these descriptions of Christ that we're going to look at uh, today and next time uh, are part of what we've seen in chapter 1. Third statement is a statement of what God sees. There is this, uh, this image of, of the lampstand uh, standing for the church and Jesus walking around. And it is, what, is, what does Jesus see as he looks at the church? What is it he sees? Because he doesn't just look what's on the surface. He sees what's underneath. He sees the reality. So what is it that he sees? And then we've got the, the substance of the letter. Sometimes it's, it's statements of praise. Uh, sometimes it's blame. Sometimes it's threat. Sometimes it's a whole mixture of, of those. Uh, that's like the, the body of the letter, the substance of the letter. And then there's always a summons to obedience. In the light of this, this is what you should do. And then they finish with a promise of blessing. Promise of blessing to those who overcome. And all those promises are repeated later in the book. They all come again in chapters 20 to 22. So in each letter, we've got a looking back to Jesus and to what has happened following his resurrection, his place now in the universe, and are looking forward to his return, to the second coming, when Jesus comes back, which is what the end of Revelation is about, which we'll get to eventually. It starts with a looking back, it finishes with a looking forward, and the middle is about how life is now. And that reminds us of something that is important. You see, we as a church here, we live in a position. A position where we are after Jesus' death, resurrection, exaltation, return to heaven, and his position of authority and power as a result of that. So that's, if you like, our history. We look back on that, what Jesus has done for us. But we also look forward to what he's going to do to his return, and to our spending eternity with him. And we live in between those two things. And as we sit in between those two, that affects how we live. Do you understand that? You know, for you in life now, in human terms, you know, what has happened to you as you have grown up, as, as you've the experiences that you have, that has made you feel like where you are today. But you also live your life, most people, in the context of what is to come in the future, in the way that you behave, in the decisions that you make. And as church, that is how it is. We have our, our past, we have our future, and we're situated in the middle. But Jesus fills the horizon as we look back, and Jesus fills the horizon as we look forward. So he fills our horizon in every direction. And it's with that in your mind that we need to listen to these letters. So what we're going to do is we're going to work through uh, three letters this morning. I'm going to explain some of the symbolism and uh, uh, what's going on in the letter. And at the end of each letter, I'm going to ask you a question. It's going to be the same question each time. So you might want to be listening as we work through, because the question's going to be, in the light of this letter, what is God saying to us today? Not what did God say to the church then, not what God is saying to the church in the future, but in the light of this, what is God saying to the church today, to us today? That's the question we're going to come to three times this morning and four times next time. So you're going to be ready for that? Well, a few. So let's begin with this uh, first prophetic message. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. 
These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Now, cast your mind back. What's the significance of that statement? These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. What is the significance of those two statements? Can you remember? Hmm. Not hugely encouraging. When somebody says, oh yes, it was on the tip of my tongue. I think it indicates that God's with us now. Um, the seven stars and the lampstand represents the church and the stars are the future and where it's going to grow, I think, or something like that. I'm not quite right on that. Not quite right. Now you're right about the lampstands. The lampstand is, is the church. So if you like, Greenford Baptist Church has a lampstand in the imagery here. In the, you know, there is a lampstand, Greenford Baptist Church. And right now, just so you're aware of that, Jesus is walking around the church. Right this morning, he's walking around in the way that is pictured here in Revelation. He's walking around the church. And the question which we're going to be working at this time and next time is what does he see and what does he say? But what are these seven stars about? Um, is Jesus saying that he has authority over um, everything because they were concerned about these seven um, uh, astrological things mm -hmm. before and Jesus is saying, I hold the, all this thing in my hand so I'm the one who's in authority here. Yeah, it's a claim to authority and it's a claim to authority in two ways. Uh, the, the seven stars in the right hand, the right hand is, is having control over. Um, the seven stars stand for two things. Uh, in, the, uh, in the cult of the emperor... One of the things that uh, it, the, the, uh, the, the pictures show is the emperor holding stars. It's a sign of political authority. So the statement is that Jesus is making is, I have all the political authority. The state might look powerful. They might be giving you a hard time, but at the end of the day, I am in control. But also there is a, a statement that's aimed at uh, those that believe that the stars influence their future. And there, as you know, there are people today that believe that. There were people in those days that believed that. They're, of course, as wrong today as they were then because the only person that influences the future is Jesus. And the statement is, I hold the stars. So you don't need to worry about cosmic forces and all of that sort of stuff because I hold the stars. So we have Jesus, the statement of political authority and power walking around the church. As he looked at the church at Ephesus, he saw them, uh, he observed their zeal. Now if you looked at their weekly notices, there were lots of activities. He looked at uh, their refusal to compromise. They stayed faithful. They wouldn't tolerate any compromise in serving God. And he also looked at their endurance, because being a Christian in those days was tough. You were automatically had received social stigma because you were a Christian. In your work you'd be marginalised, there'd be professions you weren't able to be a part of, and so on and so on and so on, because you were a Christian. And they were enduring that. So, a big tick so far for the church in Ephesus? Yeah? You can nod, it's okay, it's safe to nod. But then this, yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do not, sorry, repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favour. You hate 
the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Endured hardship, zealous, refused to compromise, but something had been lost. Forsaken your first love, that's referring back to how it was when they first gave their lives to Jesus. So think for a moment. What do you think here Jesus is referring to? What is it that this church that is zealous, enduring hardship, refusing to compromise, what do you think it is that they've lost? And it is, it's, it's not about a feeling because it actually says Repent and do the things you did at first. So it's not about that somehow they've not any longer got the, the fuzzy, warm feeling of love. Because it doesn't say, feel the things that you felt at first. It says, do the things that you did at first. So what do you think that's about? What do you think, uh, what sorts of things do you think that Jesus is referring to? See some puzzled faces. I was thinking maybe like um, getting back into a relationship with God and that, yeah. Okay, yeah. Relationship with God, that could well be a part of it. Refind, re refinding in themselves the boldness to share what they'd first fell in love with. Um, when you're a young Christian, you're quite often eager to go out on the street and tell everybody about it. And that after a period of time, you lose that hunger quite often and it could be that the church lost that for a while that is absolutely dead right that's bullseye absolutely bullseye i'll come back to that in just a moment i see someone pointing but i don't see where you're pointing to i'm so i'm so sorry i'm so sorry i was just going to say what she said that when i first became a christian all i wanted to do was read his word and tell everyone i met about him mm. and that is exactly what is being talked about here and uh, there are uh, I could go into for, for a number of reasons um, uh, why that is, that is the case here. But that is the central thing that is here. Because remember, that's what a lampstand, what does a lampstand do? Lampstand sheds light. And the light is the symbol, as we saw last time, of God's presence in the community. So in all their zealous, in all their enduring hardship, in all their refusing to compromise, they'd forgotten that passion of telling other people about Jesus. You know how it is, don't you, when, when uh, let's leave being a Christian on the side for a moment, when someone finds some new, new hobby. Aren't they a pain? Do you know what I mean? They found this wonderful new hobby, uh, whatever it happens to be, and every time you see them, what do they talk about? That hobby. I'm thinking one of my family, I won't tell you which one, but there's, there's a particular hobby that, that he found. Uh, uh, that gives you a clue that it wasn't Naomi. <laughs> Figured out a hobby that he found a little while ago, and, and every conversation there is a reference to this particular hobby, which I actually don't understand at all. I mean, it's completely over my head. In fact, the other one has found another hobby, and he keeps talking about that as well. So, uh, and, has he, and has even bought me a ticket so I can try it out. <laughs> you see the point? He's found this great hobby, he's really, really enjoying it. And uh, he wants everyone else to be involved. So, in fact, he's given uh, a ticket to try this hobby to every other member of the family. Which I think is really nice. I'm not, I'm not knocking that. But do you see? Because there is this passion about that. I suspect if he stays with the hobby in two or three years' time, still doing it, he won't be all the time talking about it. When you first became a Christian... You told everybody, didn't you? Do you remember? I mean, I can remember. It was a long time ago. I became a Christian 40 years ago, and I can still remember telling everyone else in my, my class at, at, uh, at school, teachers, my parents, they were a bit bewildered. I think they thought I'd gone even stranger than I was already. <laughs> Everywhere, telling people about Jesus. 
But as we've been Christians longer, we can lose that passion, can't we? If Steve wasn't taking ballistic at the moment, uh, he at this point will be jumping up and down, saying tonight, here at 6.30, we have an event that's telling people about Jesus. And he will be going on about the invitations that are on the back that he'll be giving out in the foyer when you leave. It's not too late to go and invite someone, not to come along tonight, but to come with you this evening. Not too late to do that. I wonder what your passion is for telling people about Jesus. That's what this church, the church in Ephesus, had lost. We're going to look at the Nicolaitans later. I won't talk about them now. They crop up uh, in uh, the letter after next, so we'll look at them in detail then. Verse 7. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice that that is plural. It's plural every time. It's not what the Spirit is saying to the church in Ephesus. It's the Spirit saying to the churches, then and now. To him who overcomes... I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Adam and Eve, this is pointing back to the story in Genesis of Adam and Eve. They lost the plot when they ate the apple. Do you remember why they were excluded from the garden? They were excluded from the garden, so they didn't eat from the tree of life and live forever. Look at the promise here. He who overcomes will have the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise or the garden. Paradise is a Persian word. It simply means garden. In the garden of God. What's that about? Well, to those who overcome, they will have the right to eternal life. And sharing not just all that Adam and Eve lost, but more besides. That same relationship, that same intimacy with God. That's the promise. So here's the question. What is God saying to us here in this church family from this passage this morning? I think what God is trying to say is it's because Adam and Eve didn't overcome, we have to overcome what, you know, and get the victory mm-hmm. over sin. Yeah, very good. What else? He's seen all that this church has achieved in the past, and he's asking us now to refine the passion to take it outside of the building. And he promises that he's going to reward us for having, finding the courage to do that. Mm. It's part of our our statement as as church, isn't it? In our our mission statement, in our strategic objectives, uh, we have the statement that we want to communicate the good news about Jesus to everyone who lives in this area. Yes, we're doing things outside the area as well through our, our work overseas, but specifically, we believe God has called us to communicate the good news about Jesus to everyone in this area. And that isn't something which we just leave to the evangelism team, to the people that go out on the streets, It's something which we are all to be involved with, with our friends and neighbours and network of people. And when we come to Easter, you'll read in the church magazine today, uh, which is out today, you'll read about the programme for Easter. We're wanting everyone who's a part of the church here, put your hand up if you're a part of the church here, you can see yourself a part of the church, whether you're in membership or not, just keep your hand up for a moment. God wants everyone who's got your hand up, this Easter, we want you all telling people about Jesus in the streets around Greenford. We want you all involved in knocking on doors, offering to pray for people. We're going to give you training for that. And we also want a number of you out on the streets offering to pray for people. Because we believe 
that this is good news. We've got good news. We're passionate about good news. We've got good news about Jesus. We want everyone to know the good news about Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's not loud enough. Amen? Amen. And he's going to hold you to that. We're not just to be busy with all the stuff, being faithful and enduring. The passion, that evangelistic zeal for telling people about Jesus. The church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your affliction and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Okay, what's the significance here of the reference back? What was it last time? The first and the last, and who died and came to life again. What's the significance of those two descriptions of Jesus? Can you remember? We looked at them last time. I think the significance is he holds the key to life. Mm -hmm. the, first and, the first and the last is, yes. ab is about that, as, is that holding all of history. It, after all, um, this only works in English, but history is his story. It's God, from beginning to end. His story. But the other statement there as well, about overcoming death. What's that about? What was the exact phrase that is used? Who died and came to life again. What was the significance of that? Say again. Resurrection. Resurrection. Yeah, it's a bit more than a bit more than that in in the context here. He conquered death and holds the keys mm -hmm. to death to Hades. So the fact that he conquered death and holds the keys is a huge encouragement to people who are facing potential death for their faith. That's why it's so relevant. It's not just a general thing. Oh, I've overcome death. But to you who are facing death. You can overcome. We've looked before at the, the social and legal context that people were in. There, there is an echo of something that goes on. I need to be slightly careful because this will be on the internet, but you will, you will know of situations in, in, uh, in some countries under certain laws that are in place at the moment where it's possible for um, uh, someone of a different uh, faith belief to uh, make an accusation against someone who is a Christian simply because they're successful in their business, for example, or they're doing really well in the school that they're teaching in or the school that they're heading. I'm thinking of specific situations here. And make a sort of scurrilous accusation and, and say that they are, they are mocking the official religion of this state in the way they're living their life. And people can then be imprisoned and some have died. Some of you know where I'm talking about. This is the context, the situation here. So these people were in genuine material poverty. For reasons we'll come to in the next uh, letter, understand some of the reasons that people couldn't practice some of their, um, their training, some of their, their skills, their craft. Some were going to face imprisonment. Some were going to lose their lives. Yet, God, who is in charge of history, is going to limit the persecution. Not literal ten days. It's not, you know, we start today and we finish next Wednesday, Wednesday week. It's not, it's not a literal. Ten is just symbolic of a short period of time. But it's about God's got it in his hands. It's part of the first and the last. He's limiting it. This is not out of control. God is in control here. And in the midst of the difficulty, they need to recognise that they are spiritually rich. 
and they are on the way to eternal life. And so they're called, as one person, uh, Wilcott, put it, not to be fearful, but to be faithful. Not to be fearful, but to be faithful in the context that they were in. And it reminds us that contrary to what some people like to think and some like to teach, there is no guarantee for us as Christians that we're going to live a life free from suffering and death because of our faith. That was what happened to Jesus. And for some, follow in his footsteps. It doesn't mean that God has lost the plot. It doesn't mean that God's not in charge. It's a part of what it means to be a Christian. Verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. The second death was a, an expression that was used at the time. It was uh, used in, in Jewish uh, circles. And it's a description of uh, judgment that sends people to separation from God. So we're all going to face a first death, unless Jesus comes back before we physically die. The first death. But he who trusts in Jesus then experiences eternal life. Do not face the second death of eternal separation from God, from his love, and from his life. So, here's the question. In our context, what is it that God is saying to us from this passage? What I think he's saying is that um, if you you might not have anything like, physically, but spiritually, you are the richest person. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it's partly what Denzel was saying in that testimony earlier on. Our, our value is not in the things that we have, the things that we may have accumulated. Our value is in our eternal riches. Hopefully, we've all got more in the bank of heaven than we have in the bank of earth. Because if not, we're investing it in the wrong place. <laughs> Do you hear me? Because yeah. you can't take with you what's in the bank of earth. Don't care who you bank with. Can't take it with you. Don't care what interest rate you're getting. You can't take it with you. All you can take with you is what's there waiting for you in the bank of heaven. So we can be materially very poor, but spiritually very, very poor rich okay that's one thing what else i think for me there's a there's a word against fear here and there's also a word against deals there's a word against fear in the sense that to most people there can't be anything that's more frightening than death because it's a huge unknown and he's going out of his way to remove that. Uh, but there's also a word against deals in the sense that when we're faced with that, the automatic would be to say, God, if you get me out of this, I'll do X. Or, you know, if, if, if you do this for me, I'll be your best friend or whatever. Um, and the point is that's, that's not in the deal. The, the reality is that God is who he is, whatever happens. And if, if, we, can, if we can put that in as a foundation that God is good, mm -hmm. right, what's next, then things will look, yeah. we'll have a different perspective. Very good, very good. We in uh, the UK at this point in time do not suffer persecution for being Christians. There are situations where we face discrimination against us for the fact that we're Christians, but I don't think we can really use the term persecution for what we experience here in the UK. 
But for many of our brothers and sisters in the world, persecution is their daily lot. And we need to just take on board that when difficulties do come our way, we do need to be faithful, not fearful. Because ultimately he holds the keys. Because he has overcome death. Amen. Amen. Thirdly, the church at Pergamon. To the angel of the church in Pergamon write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Can you remember what the uh, significance of that? Actually, we'll come to that in a moment. I'll read this next verse as well. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. So what's the significance, can you remember back to last time, of this double-edged sword? What is that a description of? Can you remember? Judgment. Authority. Judgment and authority, absolutely in one. Judgment, it's, it's an image of the power of God's word to, to achieve what it goes forward, uh, forth to do, and it also is about power, and it also in the context is about judgment. And this place, Pergamon, is described as where Satan has his throne. And uh, there are two possible, or maybe it is both, uh, meanings for that. There was in Pergamon a huge, uh, you could see it apparently for miles, so when I say huge I mean huge, altar to Zeus. It was on the top of a hill and it looked like a, it looked a bit like a throne when you saw from a distance and some have suggested that this is what is being referred to here, that it is this altar there, that this is where Satan is or has his throne. But there is a second suggestion, which uh, also, I think, has got a lot of strength. We know that in, in Pergamon, it was the very uh, first temple was built to worship the emperor in this region. And one of the themes that, that runs through Revelation is the way that the, the state demands loyalty, the state demands worship. And this is an early reference to that theme, perhaps, that here Satan is enthroned. This is where the state and the emperor were literally worshipped. Maybe it's a reference to both. So they get a big tick. They've remained true. They didn't renounce their faith even when people where well, Antipas was killed for his faith. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, Otherwise I will soon come to you and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now we do not have any other historic reference to the Nicolaitans outside of these references in the book of Revelation. But from the context and from the, the linking back to the teaching of Balaam which had become proverbial in, the, in that day, uh, we, are, we can guess that what was going on with these people, both those who held to the teaching of Balaam and uh, the Nicolaitans, probably two descriptions of the same sort of people. These are people that encouraged compromise with pagan society. Going something like this. In society in those days, there were lots of feasts and festivals 
There were feasts and festivals to, uh, to the state, uh, part of the imperial cult, but there also were feasts and festivals in uh, many of the guilds of craftsmen. They would hold a feast and festival, and they would have a pagan god that this would be held in honour to. So as a part of the feast and festival, whatever the sort of thing it was, there would have been, as part of the, the way that food was offered and eaten, there was worship of a pagan deity or worship of the emperor as a part of being in that meal event. And also, in many of them, there also was a lot of sex. There was uh, widespread, as part of those pagan rites, that have a lot to eat, a lot to drink, a part of their celebration, they would have sex with anybody, basically. And that was a normal part of these events. Now, if you didn't take part in those events, you were marginalised from society, you were outside the guild of craftsmen, you know, you, you, you see you're, you're pushed to the margins of society. So, it suggested that some were saying, well, actually, it's okay to go along to these things. I mean, you know, after all, we believe in Jesus, don't we? And we believe in the one true God. And of course, we know that these pagan gods don't really exist. We know that the emperor isn't really divine. And so, it doesn't really matter if, if we go along and we eat a bit of food and have a bit of sex. What does it, what does it really matter? We, we know it's only just a bit of food and a bit of fun don't we? After all, you know, if, if we do that, it means that we can actually tell more people about Jesus. Because, you know, we, we can be along at these events and be much more a part and accepted in society. You, you get the drift here. It's an argument not unlike arguments that you sometimes hear today. But this is God's word. There is no place, there is no room for compromise. And notice how strong it is here in verse 16. Jesus is saying, if you don't put a stop to this, I'm going to come and fight myself. And that's off the back of that vision that we've read in chapter 1. Do you want Jesus like that turning up to fight against you? I don't think so. <laughs> it's a very, very strong word here. No compromise. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, I will also give him a white stone with a new name on it, known only to him who receives it. Two symbols that probably, as you listen to them now, you think, what on earth is that about? Let me tell you. In 586 BC, the temple was destroyed. The Jews believed at that time that the ark was hidden. And we've had a few films about that, haven't we, in recent years? Looking for the Ark? It goes back to this belief that in 586 the Ark uh, was, was hidden. And inside the Ark, those of you that remember the series on Exodus, inside the Ark there was some manna. And the manna was hidden inside the Ark, and the Ark was hidden. Now, the Jews believed at that time that when the Messiah came, because they were expecting the Messiah to come, we believe, as Christians, that he did come and his name was Jesus. They didn't recognise that. So they were waiting for the Messiah to come, but as part of the teaching, they believed that when the Messiah came, the ark that had been hidden would be recovered. And they would all, once again, have manna to eat. The manna being a symbol of God's supplying all they needed. Are you with the image now? Yeah. Now notice the transfer that's happened here. What's being said is that you, Christians, believers in Jesus, 
you are going to be the people that receive the hidden manna. And that image has been taken over in the Gospels to, as Jesus talked about, I will not eat of this bread again until I eat it with you in my Father's kingdom. This image of the heavenly banquet that is there for all of us who are faithful to Jesus. To those that overcome, I will give some of the hidden manna. That manna had come to stand for everything that people hoped for when the Messiah came. It became a symbol for that. The white stone? Well, we know that uh, at that time, for some public events, white stones acted as tickets. There also possibly is another reference in the fact that it's a white stone to something later in Revelation, but uh, it's possible. But I, I, this is the, the explanation which seems to me to make most sense. This, this whole thing of being given a white stone, which is your permission to enter the event. You know, you're going to a, a public event now. Uh, I got an invitation this week to go to an event which the Indian High Commissioner is holding in uh, Hayes. And if I want to go to it, I have to reply to this email and I'll be security checked and they'll issue me with a ticket. And if I turn up at that event without the ticket, do you think I'm going to get in? Not a chance. If you turn up at a public event without a white stone, your name's not down, you're not coming in, to quote something else. No admission. But this has got a name on it. Now, you will know, those of you that know the Bible well, that knowing someone's name is an expression of intimacy with that person. Knowing someone's new name or their secret name is a very, very close intimacy. And if you've read on in Revelation, you will know that in uh, chapter 19, Jesus, there's an image of Jesus, and it says of him that he has a new name that only he knows. It's referred back to here. So they get the white stone with the name of Jesus. <laughs> that private name. It's an invitation to intimate relationship at the heavenly banquet with God. Isn't that fantastic? What a brilliant image. What a brilliant image. So to those who overcome, they get some of the hidden manna, which is all the stuff that's promised, when the Messiah comes, all the stuff that's there for the future, and also the white stone that guarantees admission with the name on it that says how close you are to God. So here's how it works in that society. If you choose not to go along to these earthly banquets with their food and all they offer, you can have a personal invitation, a guaranteed place at the heavenly banquet. But only if you don't go to the earthly banquets. Notice, no compromise. To him who overcomes, you'll receive the hidden manna, the white stone. So if you pay the price of not taking part in the worship, the pagan worship, the values of the society at that time. You spend eternity with God. The heavenly banquet. So, final time for this morning. What is the question? Uh, what is it that Jesus is saying to the church here this morning from this passage? Uh, if we... Uh uh, join with world, uh, the judgment is still upon us by the sword. Yeah. So. Okay. For me, it's to serve and worship God and God alone, and not to worship any other gods or partakings on earth. Um, as far as society is concerned, we as Christians um, may uh, be classed as outsiders 
but we're really the insiders. Mm. Very good. We should not compromise with idol worship. Mm. Okay. One last one. I'll go this way. Oh, two more. I'll come back to you, John. Yeah, um, for me, it's whatever the obstacles that you may face in your walk as a Christian, do not deter from it, and you will gain the rewards. <laughs> Thank you. And finally. I think this is a really tricky one because based on what we said earlier on, our passion is driving us to put the lampstand in the community or to allow it to be in the community where it's supposed to be. And yet here we're talking about very clear divisions. Um, but if we're not careful, it will lead us to basically put, uh, putting up a barricade which says, well, there's us and there's them. And so, for me, the issue is not about, do I get involved in the community? Because the answer is yes. The issue is, where, where are my lines and where do I draw them? Mm. Not, do I get involved or not? Because that's a no-brainer. Yep. So the issue is, where do I draw my line? Okay. Thank you. To sum up this morning, is this. If we stay faithful to God, being overcomers, whatever comes our way, we spend eternity with him. Let's stand. Let me pray for you. I'm going to give you a moment or two to make your own response to God. Uh, maybe something you want to say to him. I'll give you a moment or two to do that. And then uh, allow me to pray for you. Father God, we thank you for that vision that we looked at last time of Jesus. Someone like a son of man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet, golden sash around his chest, head and hair white like wool, as white as snow, eyes blazing fire, feet like bronze glowing in a furnace, voice the sound of rushing waters, holding the seven stars with the sharp double-edged sword coming out of his mouth, sun shining in all its brilliance. And, and for all those things, those images stand for, and thank you that it isn't just about then, but it is about now. And Father, for us, each of us here this morning, as a part of this church family, and, and those from elsewhere as they look at this on the internet in due course, Father, I ask that you'll help us to be people who live our lives as people who hear what your Spirit is saying to the church. People that are passionate in telling those around us about Jesus. People who are not fearful, but are faithful, whatever the consequences. And people who will not compromise with the values of our society, but stay faithful, holy, totally to you. And thank you, Father God, for your promise that for each of us that overcomes, we have a destiny for eternity with our God, our Lord and King. Amen. <laughs>